um, system just so that I can share my slides and things. Um, so, and I also have me in it as well. So there we go. So that should see me and my slides. And then I put it on a share screen. So you also get the audio and you also get it on full screen rather than just seeing. Um, so I should be full screen now, is that right? Yeah, excellent. Okay, so without further ado, I'll start. Uh, and as Amy said, what we're gonna uh, look at today, what I'm gonna kind of be talking about is just kind of giving an overview around ethical artificial intelligence and robotics, um, why it's important, why we're talking about it, um, the, the government's agenda. So the government are investing quite heavily uh, in AI and the applications of AI and robotics. And we'll look at how that um, might impact the things we do, our, our jobs, our day-to-day -day lives, uh, and how we engage as a society. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So who am I? I'm the, uh, the blurred one in the background, not normally that blurry, I assure you. Uh, so I'm Professor of Robotics and Autonomous Systems um, at the University of Hull. Uh, and I got my PhD in Computational Neuroscience and Robotics. So I was looking at modelling part of the auditory cortex uh, from the human brain and um, building a, a, a neural net model of that cortex uh, to put in robots. So robots can hear sounds, uh, disambiguate sounds and locate sounds in the environment. A lot of the work I do is bio-inspired. So I look at how biology does things. Biology is very good at learning lessons from itself. Um, and so we, we look at how biology has uh, advanced the vision, how we can track objects, how we can interact with people and, and try to put that in robots and AI. So one of my main areas of interest is around human robot interaction. Um, and particularly over the past couple of years, I've been looking at trust and how we build trust and how we build trust in systems, how we build trust in robots, in AI. And that's gonna be kind of the focus of what we talk about today. So what um, I should have said actually um, is, I'll just find the chat and I'm just gonna put a URL um, into the chat and I can find it. Uh, I can't seem to get to it. Uh, I don't know if uh, Amy, if you can put something in the chat for me, menti.com. What I'd like you to do, uh, if possible, <laughs> is on your phone or on a browser, if you can go to www.menti.com Dot com. Uh, and what I'm going to try and do throughout the talk, just to make it a little more interactive, is I'll have a series of questions and we can vote and we can we can discuss that and we can see what people think as we go through. Um, I've got a few slides like that. If it doesn't work, we'll, we'll skip over them as we go through. But hopefully we can we can see that as a bit more interactive. So building ethical AI. Um, what's the problem? Um, there's a lot of talk about it at the moment. Why is it hot issue? Why, why are people... Uh, Concerned about ethics in AI, how does it impact our lives and the things we do? Oh. There we go. Oops. So, there we go. So, the first question, uh, which I'm going to ask out, so you can see the URL at the top there on the slide, you need to enter that number 7176581, and it'll be the same number throughout. Um, is artificial intelligence a danger? There's been a lot of news stories uh, for quite a number of years, actually. Um, um, Stephen Hawking famously said that AI will eventually take over and will eventually um, replace mankind and, and we're all doomed um, to, to fail due to, due to the rise of artificial intelligence. And the media has certainly uh, covered it um, quite extensively. Uh, lots of films we might have seen about AI, um, a few I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so we've got here about a 50-50 split. People think yes and only in the wrong hands. And no one thinks AI isn't a danger, which is quite interesting. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have uh, some respondents that think no, it might not be, it might not be a danger. Um, so kind of the distribution we've got there kind of fits what's, what's been out in media and what people have been talking about. Um, and that is... AI can be a force for good. We, we use it in more ways than, than when we possibly realize, and I'll talk about some of that in a moment. Um, but also it can be used incorrectly, it can be manipulated, uh, it can uh, potentially be used uh, wrong, so only in the wrong hands. Um, may, it be, may it be a danger. Okay, so excellent, that worked quite well, that's great. So we'll, we'll keep 
doing those mentees as we go through. So this is kind of what people might think about in the future, robots and um, AI and the dangers they might bring. Um, and this is a scene from Terminator or one of the Terminator movies. Um, and that's kind of what we think about when we talk about the future of robots and AI and the dangers is people think of, of machines uh, rising and taking over. Uh, there's been a number of other kind of uh, films around that. Matrix is a very f uh, famous one where we're all uh, in a simulation run by machines. Um, and this is kind of less ominous, I guess. And this is uh, how... 9000, which was a disembodied AI. Uh, so it was a voice, um, famous quote. Um, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave, from the film. Um, and this is, is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about AI being embodied. So in, in robots, in machines, but also as a, as a disembodied entity and how we use AI algorithms and how those algorithms might be used um, in industry, in society, um, and what we need to be aware of as we go through. So kind of embodied versus, versus the, the disembodied AI. So it's not just about physical machines. It's also um, about how we interact with AI. It's about uh, our smart speakers. It's about our phones. Um, you may not be aware, you may be aware, if you've got an iPhone and you say, Hey Siri, show me all photos of a car. Um, any picture you've taken of a car will appear on your phone. And it goes through and it looks through all those photos without you knowing it's doing it, categorize them, tags them. You can say, hey Siri, show me all photos of a tree. And any pictures you've taken that's got a tree in it, it'll, it'll, it'll show you. Um, and that is part of, part of AI, part of artificial intelligence. Um, your phone is going through your photos and it's working out what it can see in those for in, in in those images whether it can detect trees or cars or people or chairs and those kinds of things and we'll talk a bit about that as well um, as we go through the talk so here we see uh the famous uh echo i can't say the the name of it because mine will switch on and start talking to me um so that is from amazon the amazon echo dot um which we might all be be very familiar with um here is a series of uses people might use uh, these devices for and that when this data was collected uh, a couple of years ago when they were first coming out this data is quite old now it's about three or four years old um 85 percent of, of people would use it to do things like set a timer so maybe use it as an alarm clock wake you up in the morning tell you when the spuds are cooked for for dinner that kind of thing um we would have 82 percent of people using it to play songs and use it for music and as we go down we've got people for, nearly half of people um, using these devices for shopping lists and I'll talk a bit about that as we go forward as well um, and there's lots of other uses you can use it for trivia and things like that. Last year when this when this data was collected um, so 2019 January 2019 100 million of the Amazon variants of these smart speakers were sold so there was over 100 million of these devices in homes listening to everything we say uh, waiting to be activated, to play a song, to set a timer, to do some other things as well. And in total, over 200 million of all variants um, have been sold. So that includes the, um, the Google Home devices as well, as well as the Microsoft smart speakers. Um, funny enough, received over a million marriage proposals. But any batches around will be happy to know has turned them all down so far so I'm still waiting um, so lots of um, interactions that are used with those devices and way in which we engage with them and uh, the things we can use these devices for we can control our lights so we can turn our lights on and off we can turn our heating on and off I found out the other day uh, that my Amazon will control my Xbox so I can turn my Xbox on and off and do various things as well so we're starting to use these smart devices a lot more uh, the AI, the, the understanding they have, the, the things they know we like to do and the things we do regularly, uh, they start to learn and understand so that they can be better for us and, and help us better. So what can this device do? As I've said, it can do lots of things, control your TV, it can turn the TV over, it can order things from Amazon for you, you can buy items on it, you can drop in to phones, you can make phone calls, you can drop into other devices and have chats and all sorts of stuff, control your heating, everything uh, that can be done through these. So those robots will start learning that the AI that's in those devices will start to learn 
how we use them um, and we'll when they make mistakes and we correct it we'll learn from those mistakes as well there's lots of other AI uses. I just want to talk a few about um, how AI is also used in other areas and domains. So it's not just things like smart speakers. We do have algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms that would help for things like cancer diagnosis and detection um, and have been proven to be a lot more um, uh, detections a lot sooner um, than, than surgeons and doctors. So there's definitely a good and a benefit there in those kinds of applications. And we're using AI for other, other things like climate change. We're looking and trying to understand, let me just turn off some of the audio here, uh, uh, how to understand how we can look after the climate. We're starting to understand how temperatures are changing and the effects we have on, on carbon emissions and how that might impact climate change. And we can model all this and we can model this with AI and we can, a part of data science, AI and data science go quite, hand in hand quite close together. I noticed from the attendee list, got quite a few of our students from the MSc and AI uh, data science uh, program. Um, and data helps inform AI systems and that's quite important, which I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes as well. So the university is, is looking at uh, developing a system called ARC, uh, which will look at flood resilience and flood risk. And a lot of what's happening in this project is involving artificial intelligence. It's involving modeling, it's involving data, it's involving understanding that data and having algorithms interpret that data for us. And that's a key thing, it's, it's the AI interpreting the data. Um, and this is kind of the nub of, of what I wanna talk about um, as we progress through this talk today. Some of the applications I've been using AI for, so uh, security applications. So here we see an X-ray of a bag. Uh, and in that bag, we can we can quite easily see that there's a, a part of a gun um, is is gone through that X-ray, and we can have AI algorithms that will detect those for us and will tell us, yeah, there's a gun that's been detected in that bag, and we can train this AI to be responsive to different types of guns, to different parts of guns, to different elements, um, and it can you know the positive of of AI is if you've got a worker stood there looking at hundreds and hundreds of x-ray images. You've got to change them over every every 30 minutes or so. It's very tiring just looking at a screen. Whereas an AI doesn't get tired, doesn't go to sleep, doesn't need breaks, just continues to go. Um, and can detect things that maybe people can't. So uh, here's another image. So this is a, a, a luggage piece of luggage going through with a laptop. And in there, we've got to detect the possibility that there might be some illicit items. We look at that and it all looks pretty fine. Uh, some batteries in there, there's some fans in there, there's a CPU, we can see that it's clearly a laptop. Um, but what else is a hard drive in there, a CD-ROM drive by the looks of it. Um, what else? There's a little item on the left, uh, the right hand side, sorry, um, that the AI will detect out and that is a magazine from a hand pistol um, that it detected. And so we can use AI in situations such as helping us with the economy, helping us with climate, helping us with security, lots of different ways in which we can apply different AI algorithms. Um, we can use them in the home, we can use them on our phones, on our computers, help us do our work, help us do our jobs, that kind of thing. A lot more um, robotics and AI, so the, the, the kind of embodiment that I was talking about at the beginning, uh, is starting to be used a lot more for things like surgery. So there are um, robotic surgeons now, so you can see here, it still has people involved, still have people controlling them, but what we have over the patient on the bed is a very, very steady, controllable set of robot arms. And what that does is the, the surgeon controlling it through the computer while they might have kind of slight tremors or slight movement in their hands that we just, you know, we can't, we can't not, not have, we can't stop, um, a machine doesn't have. So what we can do is give it instructions and tell it the region we want it to maybe cut or if it's doing neurosurgery. Um, and the robot can do a lot finer, a lot finer control for us. Um, so we are starting to see robots and AI being used in these kinds of scenarios as well. We'll start to get interactive medical assistance. So there is now, uh, when you go onto a lot of websites and NHS, uh, the uh, 
111 service will do this for you on the website as well, where it will take you through a series of questions. What are your symptoms? Have you got a temperature? Have you got a cough? Um, could it be uh, COVID related? Have you been in contact with someone who's tested positive? It will ask you a series of these questions. And from those questions, it will give you a diagnosis. It will tell you what it thinks it might be. Um, so yeah, so, so there's a lot of kind of different applications that we can see from, from AI and you know, it, it, it stretches really wide. Loads of areas are starting to look at the power of what AI can be used for um, and how we can use it. What I kind of want to bring the conversation around to now is around the way in which this is going to impact us as we move forward in future years and, and the way in which industry is starting to uh, adapt robots and use machines in, in factories and in the workplace and things like that. And to bring it around again back to, back to trust. So a really kind of big area of robotics is something called the Uncanny Valley. And the Uncanny Valley is around the appearance of a machine, what a robot looks like. And the more human it looks like, um, the better we kind of familiarize ourselves with it up to a point and then there's there's um, where's man there's there's a kind of that way, there's a dip um, I move myself across uh, there we go um, well um, that says as it gets closer to being really human like looking very much like a human we get very uncomfortable with it and that's called the uncanny valley well there's also a body of research now looking at personality and how we interact with these AI systems. We are going to have to interact in a social manner and how do we make these systems respond to us in a way that we feel comfortable but aren't too maybe creeped out by them as well. So that's uh, part of what builds, builds our trust uh, and interaction with those systems. So I'll show you kind of some uncanny valley robots now. So here's one here. Uh, this is a very human-like looking robot. Um, and we kind of feel okay looking at that I think um, when it moves it changes our perceptions a little bit but then we have something uh, which is a robot I've worked with um, many many years ago and um, with the university I used to work at uh, which is Casper and this I find this robot very disturbed <laughs> I, yeah, I get very disturbed when I used to interact with that robot um, and this is to work with children with autism and to interact um, and, and do kind of research experiments around human robot interaction um, which with children with autism. So that's around the physical appearance, that's the uncanny valley. So now we need to look at the kind of personality and how AI can interact and how we can engage with it um, and how we can make it um, feel comfortable when we're interacting. So I guess the question to ask is why is this important? Why are we looking at ethics in AI, why are we looking at embodiment and robots? Um, what is important about this? Here's some new stories we'll, we'll, we'll I'll talk about very briefly. So um, the government invested quite a lot of money uh, a few years ago uh, to look at a benefit system that could determine whether someone needs to receive benefits or not. So rather than having people look at the applications, it was all managed by um, an AI system. They called it robots in the article, um, but they're talking about a kind of algorithm. Um, and what they found was it was making lots and lots of mistakes. It was making lots of errors. It was telling people they could um, have money when um, they weren't in the right categories and, and people who didn't have enough money, it was, it was saying they, they didn't qualify for universal credit, and lots of things. So that was very quickly pulled, um, but they were hoping that that AI could replace uh, lots of application processes, um, but it didn't, failed quite miserably, and we'll talk about why that might be shortly. So that's one application in the real world uh, that's currently, um, that, that was tried and failed. And then there was, there was this, this was, uh, this was quite an interesting article, and this did the rounds uh, in the computer science domain, lots of people talking about this, uh, and this was one of the, the, the kind of main kickstart and factors for discussing ethics in, in AI and algorithms. Um, and what this was, it was, it was, as I mentioned about the kind of COVID 111 service, it was an online AI, it was an online algorithm that asked people questions if they were feeling unwell uh, and gave them a result of what it may be and what they should do as a result of that. And what would happen is if, if a male respondent went along and used the app, 
and put in that they were male and of a certain age um, and answered some questions and said maybe um, they had some problems with their chest, problems breathing, um, maybe dizzy, that kind of thing. It would tell them to very quickly seek medical attention uh, and to contact 999. Um, it was potentially that they could be having a heart attack. So it would, it would send male respondents that way. However, um, it was found that not with all cases, but with a large majority of female cases, as you can see here, um, a 60 year old female smoker reported sudden onset of chest pains and nausea and was told she's just suffering from hysteria. Don't worry, sit down, relax, have a cup of tea, you'll be fine. Um, okay, so that's not right. Why are we seeing males being told very quickly to um, seek medical help and a large proportion of females being told? it's just anxiety or it's just um, hysteria and, and don't worry it'll pass. So there was clearly very big problems with the way in this, in which this AI um, was, was, was working. So it was very quickly pulled, even though uh, the, edu the health secretary said it was fantastic and brilliant app. It was clearly very flawed. Um, so again, why is this important? Why are we talking about these kinds of applications? There was a study done a couple of years ago, so um, I think it was last year, where Forbes magazine looked at the amount of money that is being invested into robotics and AI in the workplace. And by 2022, so only two years away, they expect $210 billion will be invested in AI and robotics in the workplace. And that will be um, for production lines, for mailing uh, boxes in warehouses, for, for packaging, that kind of thing. And more and more of us are going to find ourselves somehow interacting with a robot, an embodied robot, or AI. And we need to understand what that's going to do, how that's going to work, and how we're going to kind of change our work practices. The ONS has said that lots um, of jobs are going to be replaced by AI, um, and they, they gave a category of, of which of those jobs might be. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, this is, this is really bad, you know, we're, we're losing uh, lots of jobs potentially to AI and robotics. And we could find ourselves waiting for, for a job queue and being uh, behind a number of robots uh, that might be applying for the same position with us. However, it's not all actually doom and gloom. And what I wanna talk about now is something called Industry 4.0. The first revolution, the industry, the kind of first initial industrial revolution, I guess, was around the steam and water power and mechanization of, of those kinds of technologies. Um, that happened many, many years ago, long before my time. And then we had the second revolution, which was mass production and electricity. And lots of people were worried that mass production would replace people's jobs. Uh, those cobblers, those people that made clothes, those tailors, might be replaced by jobs, but actually what happened was people reskilled, people upskilled, people changed into different areas, and we had people working in factories, big automated factories for mass production, um, powered by steam and electricity, uh, and we had people that would design those factories, that would maintain those factories, that would uh, supervise those factories, and again, the third industrial revolution was around IT, and I do remember when I was at university and, and doing a bit of, of history of computing, that when the computer kind of came to prominence in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of worry about the replacement of jobs from computers and how it would replace uh, workers and, and be a lot of uh, unemployment. And I think it absolutely couldn't be further from the truth with the creation of the computer. I think far more compute, far more jobs have been created as a result of the invention and the use of computers that have ever been replaced by computers. You know, if you, if you think about the jobs people do now, the, the, the possibilities that exist as a result of, of having IT and, and computers. And Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, is around cyber systems, uh, AI, robotics. And again, the same is gonna be said. We're gonna look at ourselves upskilling, we're gonna look at ourselves inventing new work domains, new, new, new jobs, new things to do, and I think we will see far more jobs created as a result. However, we've got to be careful around the implementation of AI because a lot of workers looked at bias and how bias might exist in AI systems. And we've just seen some cases of that with the Work and Pensions and with the Health App 
um, talk about hysteria. So I want to spend a little time looking into that right now. So what I'd like to ask, another question on mentees, so we'll, we'll, we'll pause there for, for 30 seconds or so and ask, do we believe algorithms can be biased? And think about that, think about the, um, the, the phraseology of what I've used there, can algorithms be biased? So we've got about 50-50 between yes and only because of their programmer, so only the people that put them together. Okay. Give that just another minute or so. Um, so no one thinks that algorithms aren't biased or only sometimes. That's interesting. We'll have a little look at that. We'll discuss that in a moment. Okay, so great, we've got a split, pretty much a split down the middle. Look at those numbers, it's probably about two more on the uh, only because of their programmer. So we think, yes, algorithms can be biased uh, and only because of their programmer uh, is where we, we feel that bias comes in. That's really interesting. Here is a Google search I did, five, well, probably about 15 minutes before I started this presentation. I wanted it to be as, as pretty much up to date as I could. And I typed the word hands into Google. That's what I typed. Um, just typed the word hands. And that's what came back on a Google Im image search. It was the top link and you can try that yourselves. Uh, you probably get a similar result maybe. What do we notice about that? What do we notice about that image search for the word hands? Well, I think what we, what properly jumps out at us is all those hands bar one, two, maybe three or four images. Yeah, so all those hands bar three or four images are white. So when you Google the word hands, predominantly the images you get back are white hands, okay? And what you will find is when you're designing algorithms to maybe be a face detector, to detect people or to be a hands detector for you know interactive VR or or whatever application you're working on. It's unfortunate but it's true <laughs> one of the go-to places to get a lot of images is Google and then you just scrape them all off Google and you create a data set and away you go. Um, <laughs> and it happens it happens all the time. So if I wanted to make a hand detector in 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 AI either using AI using machine learning and I wanted to get some images of hands, I might go to Google, I might type the word hands, and they're the images I'm gonna get back, and they're the images I'm gonna to have to work with. And 90% of those images are of white hands. And I didn't type white hands, I didn't type uh, Caucasian hands, I just typed the word hands. So why has, has that come back like that? Well, there's an algorithm in Google that returns what it thinks a hand is, and there could be bias in that algorithm. I then scrape these images off and I use it in my system, and I then induce bias in my system because I've only used white hands that Google has provided me because its algorithm has only detected, has only provided white hands because that was based on, on some potential bias. And that's where, that's where this bias starts to come in. Um, let me see what the next slide is. So, Here's, a, here's, a, here's another um, quite interesting um, system for you. Some of the students doing the AI data science may have already heard about this, because uh, I know Ashley likes to talk about this one, but um, here we've got Husky or Wolf. Um, do we think the one on the left is a Husky or a Wolf, or the one on the right is a Husky or a Wolf? They look very, very similar. Uh, I must admit, I, I can't really tell them apart, although I do know on this image which is which. Um, because I put it the same order as it's written at the top. So a husky is on the left and the wolf is on the right. Um, and what happened was, uh, let me see the next slide, yeah. So what happened was there was a researcher um, looking at building a detector to detect between huskies and wolves, okay? Now, the way AI works is we're starting to use a very new modern technique. As I said, it's modern is probably been around for about five or six years now um, in in, in, in some being used in, in quite some anger now, uh, is something called convolutional neural networks. Um, and what they do is they take lots and lots and lots of images 
and they extract features from those images. They pull out lines, they pull out edges, they pull out contrasts, um, they look at color differences, they look at changes, and the algorithm learns those features, as we can see at the bottom of this image here, and it learns those features to understand what constitutes the image we're trying to train it for, okay? And it looks for similarities. So when we train, for example, a good example is if we're training a detector to detect a chair, we don't show it not chairs. You never train it with a not chair. You only train it with, here's a load of images of chairs, and it will pull out the features that exist that are common between all those images. So we've got our husky, we've got our wolf. Um, and there's lots of common features across those two, but how do we dis uh, dis disaggregate or disambiguate between a husky and a wolf? The detector that was created, um, that was used, was also used by the military for detecting Russian tanks versus American tanks as well. There's another very similar scenario. And it was 99.999% accurate. There's only a couple of cases where it would fail and think a wolf was a husky or a husky was a wolf or it didn't detect it at all. Now, here we look at a convolutional neural network, and these are the kind of features that might be extracted if we were trying to detect that yellow car. So you've got edges, you've got circles, which might be the wheels, you've got contrast differences. Effectively, an AI is pretty much a black box. We don't know what's inside it. We don't understand the internal mechanisms. We know something goes in, we know something happens, and we know the output of that is a detector that will tell us whether it's a car, whether it's a bike, whether it's a bus. Um, but we're not too, you know, we have, we, have a, we have an idea, but we're not too sure of what it's doing internally. We just have trust, we have faith in that it's detecting it. Um, and what the Husky detector found out to be doing was every picture of a wolf that was passed into the training set was in a snowy background. And every picture of a husky was 99% not a snowy background. So all the detector was actually doing was detecting snow. That was it. It was just saying, majority of the background's white, it must be a wolf. And that's all it was doing. So is the bias in the algorithm, I'll kind of come back to that, that question we asked, is the bias in the algorithm or is the bias in the data? And that's the big question. Is it the data we use to train our AI? Um, here's another little video. I'm hoping that the audio works on this. Uh, I've told it to pass the audio through. So let us see. I'm going to play this for a moment or two. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go. What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it just walk out technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. So I really like the... Um no lines, no checkout uh, tagline there. When it first opened, there was a few in California, the queue was round the block four times. Um, everyone wanted to try it out. So that's an example of how AI is being used in industry and today, and there's, there's quite a few of these Amazon Go shops around the US um, that, that are being used. Uh, people do go into them and, and try them out, but there are flaws in those systems as well. And that 
comes back to how the data is trained to recognize people, to recognize skin tones, to recognize shapes, to recognize clothes they might be wearing, those kinds of things. So we've got to be very careful and we've got to be, we've got, we've got to have this trust that we understand that the system we've created does the job we need it to do for us. Um, and that comes down to, to this idea of trust. Okay. Um, do we have faith in the algorithm? Do we have faith in the programmers? Do we have faith in the data um, and, and how it's being used for us? So what we wanted to do, we wanted to also look at how people responded to embodiment and whether people thought, well, whether, whether the perception of, of an AI in an embodied robot versus a computer screen changed people's perceptions. And what we did is we created a series of experiments with a humanoid robot. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, and we played paper, rock, scissors, uh, rock, paper, scissors. Um, we played with a player against the screen, against just a computer screen, uh, where it would pop up and it would say three, two, one, make your choice. Um, and then the player versus the robot. Both algorithms in the computer and in the robot were identical. Um, they were both random. Um, and then we had what we call Wizard of Oz, which is someone controlling the robot, but the participant doesn't know about that, doesn't know they're controlling it, so that we could influence the decisions that were being made. And we got some really interesting results on this. We got some really kind of, we didn't expect the kind of results that came back. So there's the robot, uh, it's a 3D printed robot. It's the one on the right. Um, and then there's one of my students there as well, uh, playing the game. So. What we found was that when the participant was playing against the computer, when they were sat in front of their screen and they were just making a choice, they didn't feel like there was any cheating. If the participant lost five, six, seven, eight times on a run, they put it down to look and they said, oh, I'm not very lucky at this game or I'm not very good at it. And that was it, that was kind of their result. When they were playing against the robot and they lost many times, they insisted that the robot must be cheating. The robot's got eyes, it's got cameras for its eyes, clearly it must be doing something it must be watching the movement of the player and it must be responding to that even though it was exactly the same algorithm um, that was in the in the computer screen so it seemed that the participants thought playing on a computer screen was more fair and as soon as you take that algorithm and put it into a physical robot their perceptions change okay something must be happening it must be cheating i can't be this unlucky at this game um, so, so it, was quite, it was quite an interesting kind of result for us uh, that we came to. So another kind of mentee question uh, would be, if we had this kind of robot, this is our humanoid robot Mark, stands at about uh, six foot tall. We've got our little now robot, who's about two feet tall. Uh, and then we've got our Amazon smart speaker. And if you were playing a game against one of these three, um, which one would you prefer, I guess? Um, so which one of those three robots would you prefer and the the question is what qualities about that robot inform your decision on why you prefer it so i'll give you a minute or so just to pop up some questions on that so if you chose now what is it about now that means you you'd prefer that 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 kind of robot that layout that structure of robot Yep, so he chose now he's cute, he's small. That's true, he's a very cute little robot. <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't think the other one hurts that much either, so don't worry about it. Um, not very fast, certainly won't win any uh, boxing matches. Um, friendly. Okay, so that's actually, there's a really interesting comment there actually, um, which is not owned by Amazon. So there is also that involvement with, with the AI and the robotic systems is the companies that might, that might own them, might control them, that might have an influence in, in how they're being used. Um, personality controllable, looks friendly, looks like a human, yeah. So you've got lots of qualities there um, that help us inform why um, we prefer a particular type of system to work with. Some of those are around um, not belonging to a particular organization uh, and somewhere around the, the pure appearance, the appearance of that robot um, with friendly and cute being um, the main ones there in the middle. So, so that's great.
So how is this going to impact the future? Um, robots and AI, the use of them are definitely growing. Uh, we've got driverless cars. The government's announced for the UK um, that in the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing autonomous cars. They give licenses out now so people can start testing them. On roads, we can start seeing them being used. Um, and how is that going to impact what we do? Here's a, 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 a philosophical kind of philosophy 101 question for you. This is what's called the trolley problem or the runaway trolley. There's, there's a trolley here on some rail tracks and you happen to be stood by a lever. If you do nothing with that lever, the trolley may injure, or worse, five people, that's near the track. Um, and if you pull the lever, it will, it will turn, it will go onto another track, and it'll injure one person, okay? So you've got this question about pulling the lever and injuring one, not pulling the lever, injuring five. Not getting involved versus getting involved, making a decision versus not making a decision. And also there's the pressure of how quick you have to make that decision now this is a there's no, no right or wrong answer to this it is it does come down to a lot of different factors um, and it is a very very famous posed question and what I'd like to do is is just on the mentee kind of put that question out there what would you do would you pull the lever or would you do nothing So there is, as I say, there is no kind of, you know, the answer isn't pull the lever or not pull the lever. It's all about your perceptions of that scenario. Should you be involved in the decision? It wasn't of your making. Do you then get involved? Do you not get involved? Um, there's also, you can extend the question as well and say, who are, you know, the people where, you know, kind of, you might want to weigh up their impact on society versus their age versus all sorts of different factors. Um, but we keep it just very, very simple on, on this particular example. Um, so what we have here is we have 78% would pull the lever and therefore it would injure or worse one person and uh, about 20% would, would do nothing. Um, and to be honest with you, every time I kind of ask this question, I do get quite a varying change. You know, sometimes we get lots of people saying we do absolutely nothing and we get lots of people that say they would pull that lever. So the question now, knowing the theme of the of the talk is um what would or what should a robot do so we have a robot in that scenario um an ai has been attached to this lever so you're thinking of a you think about a, a signaling point uh, on a railway system and it's now controlled by uh, an artificial intelligence system okay so the ai needs to make the decision so we might ask some slightly different questions and that would be should an artificial intelligence do? Should it pull a lever? Should it do nothing? Or should an AI not be involved in such decision-making processes? Okay, so that's quite an interesting response. So we've got a lot of people saying that AI should not be involved in such a decision-making process. However, AI is being used a lot more in such decisions. Um, and we think about um, airplanes, for example, fly by wire airplanes. Airplanes have been fly flying by software for a long, long time. So we've got you know people on board an airplane kind of putting their kind of faith in and trust in, in software systems. I know it's a slightly different scenario, but uh, one we could relate to. Okay, so, oh, I'll say that, ignore that question, I forgot to remove that slide. So that then takes us on to autonomous driving cars, okay? And one of the areas I'm, I'm researching with some PhD students at the moment. And we've got here, we've got an autonomous vehicle. Um, you may have heard that beep. There was a crash up ahead and the AI system detected that, detected that collision um, and informed the driver to slow down so that they knew there was a collision coming ahead. Okay, so we've now got an AI system helping humans on a driverless, on a, on a, on a smart car, I guess, not driverless, it's a, a human driving. Um, but then we're starting to go one step further. And what we have here is a Tesla. Um, and this shows a Tesla driving around driving around the street, um, making decisions, 
detecting people, detecting other vehicles, detecting road markings. Okay, and it has to make all sorts of decisions all the time. Now, this is a nice little leisurely drive. There's no cars cutting anyone up. There's no people jumping out in the middle of the road. There's nothing really to be, to be kind of worried about. But let's say we were in this scenario with a driverless vehicle. This car, you're, you're in the car, you're sitting back, relaxing, the car's driving you somewhere, and this scenario happens. And what you've got is, you've got to make a decision, or the AI has to make a decision. Does it turn left? Does it turn right? Does it carry on straight ahead? Um, what, how, how does this AI, how does, it, how does it respond? What does it do? How does it take all that information on board? And what does it use to make that, that informative decision? Now, there's, okay, so there's another mentee. So what decision would you make? Let's say you were in that scenario, you were driving the car, there's an elderly person crossing the road, there's a, a kid with a football coming in the other side, and there's a big truck heading for you straight ahead. Would you drive straight ahead? Would you steer right? Or would you steer left? What decision would you make in that scenario? And again, no right or wrong answer on this. You, you know, when we're in those scenarios, as, as people, they're very, very quick. You know, we've we very, very limited time to, to respond to it and actually make the decision. Now, there's a really big study happening at the moment, part of the robotic and AI community, called the Moral Experiment, um, which asks this exact question. Um, and it's got over 40 million responses from all over the world basically using that scenario and asking those questions. What decision would you make? Would you go left? Would you go right? Uh, would you spare the pedestrians? Would you sacrifice yourself? Would you try to save yourself and sacrifice the pedestrians? And as I say, it's a really big study looking at this because when we start to look at autonomous vehicles, these are the questions we've got to start asking. What decisions does our AI have to make? Countries with a more individualistic culture, the results uh, that kind of came back, um, the, the data here shows that if the bar is closer to one, so north of the line, respondents placed a greater emphasis on sparing the young. So what we see here is France, Greece, Canada, and the United Kingdom, those countries said they would turn right, okay? And countries such as Taiwan, China, South Korea, Japan, respondents from those countries that have took part in this moral experiment said they would turn left, okay? So what we find is that depending on a culture, depending on a background, on an upbringing, that kind of thing, we have different moral, moral results, the different, different results, different responses that we would, that we would make. Um, this one here is if it's closer to one, respondents place the greater emphasis on sparing pedestrians, so you would try to protect the two pedestrians over yourself, and below the line, you would try to protect yourself over the pedestrians. Um, so countries like Japan, Norway, Singapore, uh, Denmark, Finland, UK is quite close to the line here, but just north of it, um, would try to um, spur, would try to protect the pedestrians with its decision. Whereas other countries, uh, like China, Estonia, Taiwan, would, would go the other way. Um, and this, as I say, it's got over 40 million respondents. It's a big experiment that's continuing. It's part of the AI um, community moral experiment, it's called. Really interesting to look at, to kind of see. So, just to kind of, the last kind of word cloud, just to kind of get some, some responses from, from yourselves is, what do you think kind of constitutes or builds trust? How does something, how does something build trust with you? How do you build trust with people, um, with, e with each other? With, you know, what do you strikes out as, as trust? Is it something you know, reliable? Is it something that makes the same decisions as you make? Um, so for example, while you're putting answers in here, uh, one of the kind of scenarios I like to talk about is if we were not socially distanced at the moment and we were talking, at, you know, we were having a chat somewhere and, and I said, oh, you know, you need to be at the train station. My car's outside. Why don't you jump in and I'll take you to the train station? You'd probably think nothing of it. You wouldn't say, can I see your driving license? Can I see your insurance documents? You'd assume as most people would, that I'm insured, that I can drive, and it's my car, and you'd probably jump in and go, yeah, okay, thanks very much for the lift. If I said to you, oh yeah, you need to go to the train station, um, my car's outside, it's an autonomous car, help yourself, and uh, it'll drive itself back, off you go. You probably wouldn't 
jump in straight away. You probably wouldn't go, yeah, okay, no worries. Maybe some of you would. I know I probably would. <laughs> um, but, you know, you would still go, oh, hang on a minute. I don't quite trust it. But why do you trust me over an autonomous vehicle? When the results that are kind of coming in shows that with the sensing technology, with the AI, with the computer power, that actually an autonomous vehicle is safer in terms of accidents, collisions, response times, than maybe what, what a person could be. And it does come down to, I guess, it's in the sense of reliability, past history, reputation. It is all about kind of building up a rapport. It's about building a rapport with someone, knowing their behaviours, their past, their history, how they kind of think and operate, which we don't kind of get quite quickly with, with an AI system. So... When AI makes mistakes, there was a, a AI that was put out on Twitter, which was very quickly taken down, which was called, you can Google these, they're, they're quite used in quite a lot of AI kind of uh, scenarios. It lasted 16 hours and people were learning how to, to manipulate the AI by passing it comments. It would uh, reply back with racist response that people weren't kind of expecting. Um, and it wasn't designed to be that way. It was just designed to be a, responding to people's kind of comments and it would pick out keywords from what they said um, and it would tweet them back to them um, but failed kind of quite miserably and then this is another good one you can you can google which is uh, Sophia the destroyer of humans so this was a robot which has been given citizenship by Saudi Arabia so it's now a citizen of Saudi Arabia and was interviewed on TV um, that said okay let's kill all humans <laughs> or let's destroy sorry my, my apologies, let's destroy all humans. Um, broadcast live on, on, on uh, national TV, so it's quite, quite an interesting uh, video to see. Um, so sometimes AI does go wrong, um, but the kind of key is it's all about the data. It's not about the algorithms per se, but it's how we use that data. The, the hands example is a really good one. If you're only training AI with a certain set of data, then it doesn't understand other things. If you train an algorithm to detect dogs and you show it a picture of a cat, it's not anti-cat, it's not against cats. It's only been told what a dog is. It only knows how to recognize a dog. If similarly, if you're showing it pictures of huskies and um, wolves, and it seems to be doing a really good job in detecting them, are you certain it's using the right features? And it's not just detecting the background and the snow. And these are questions that have got to be asked when we talk about building ethical AI. What does our data look like? What's the application look like? Who's using the AI? How are we using it? And what's the purpose of it? Um, I think it's a really exciting time. I think there's so much good stuff going on at the moment in artificial intelligence. Um, I think we are going to see over the next five to 10 years, massive change in the application of autonomous systems, the application of, of AI being used pretty much everywhere. As I say, ask your phone to show you pictures of trees. Um, you know, it's already doing those kinds of things. It's already applying AI in the systems that we use every day. Um, but I do think it's a really exciting time for, for the application of AI, but we've got to be careful about how we use it and make sure that the ethical applications are there, that we are thinking about the data um, and we are using it um, ethically and in the right way. Um, but to kind of go back to the moral experiment, to the car, the autonomous car, what that does tell us is that when we are making AI systems and autonomous vehicles, depending on the country and the demographic in which we're applying and using this, we might have to have it have a different response and operate in a different way. Um, because as people, as humans, we're all different. Um, and I think I'll leave it with that quote. I think that our technologies are morally neutral until we apply them. It's only when we use them for good or evil that they become good or evil. And that's uh, science fiction writer William Gibson. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. That was, that was really good, really interesting, and finished on one of my favorite authors, excellent. Um, just to let everyone know, I hope everyone enjoyed that, just let everyone know that um, we'll also be sending out uh, an invite to a tech seminar uh, Microsoft team that we've set up uh, and we'll have a robotics, uh, AI and ethics channel that you can join and uh, continue the conversation uh, on, that, on that channel.
and uh, look out for some further tech seminars coming up over the next few months. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, thanks John. No worries.